Hi, my name is Dr. Kat Fies, and I'm from Central New Mexico Community College. Before we really dive into a course such as anatomy and physiology, we need to make sure that all of us are clear on what the words anatomy and what the words physiology really mean. Not only that, we really need to look at quite a few other definitions that are all associated with these two fields in biology. Anatomy is really a part of biology that focuses on what structures in our body look like. So keywords are form, structure, shape, as well as what their location is. And when we say body parts, we're not just saying structures that we can see with the bare eye. These are also structures that are only visible with a microscope, whether it's a your ordinary compound microscope or a more specialized microscope, let's say an electron microscope. The founder of anatomy is considered to be Vesalius and you're quite familiar with many of the images that he drew because back in the old days, very often people who studied medicine or who were very interested in human anatomy in particular and were surgeons were also very good artists because that's how they passed on their knowledge by drawing what they saw and learned. By the way, if we look at the literal translation of anatomy, it means to cut up, which therefore uh, better explains why we refer to um, the study of anatomy. Now, physiology, on the other hand, has a different emphasis. It's also a field in biology, but this time, it focuses on the functions of these body parts. So anatomy really is much more of a visual field in biology, where, while physiology really expects that you do a lot of critical thinking and reasoning to understand the functioning of the body parts and how all of these body parts uh, work together to make some major function happen. Metabolism is going to be a big component of physiology, and so we need to make sure that we're also understanding what metabolism means, and we'll do that in the next slide. I also wanted to emphasize on this slide that a person who is an anatomist or who studies anatomy must also know physiology and vice versa. So you'll often hear that these two fields are studied together, anatomy and physiology. It is true that you can take a course in just anatomy and you can take a course in just physiology at various institutions across the world, but both of these studies complement one another. One cannot be an anatomist with, without having some knowledge of how everything works and vice versa. One cannot be a physiologist without knowing what the structures look like that they're studying or where they're located. Physiology really cannot be studied without really remembering what metabolism means. And remember that metabolism refers to all of the chemical reactions that occur in our body. It doesn't matter what kind of a reaction it is, whether it is a very simple reaction that breaks down a, a molecule into its simple products, or we're building a more complex molecule, whether during the process uh, ATP is produced or ATP is, is used, or ATP doesn't even play a role, it doesn't matter. Every single chemical reaction in the body is a form of metabolism. So we need to get away from this idea that metabolism refers to the digesting of food so that uh, energy can be released. That is a small, very small component of metabolism. And so literally, catabolism, which is the breaking down of products, anabolism, which is the building of products, are both components of metabolism. 
I mentioned earlier that anatomy and physiology complement one another. We talk about the complementarity of these two fields in biology, yet we still talk about a person being primarily an anatomist versus a person being primarily uh, a physiologist. And that, that really implies that they tend to focus more on one of these two studies. Now there are many specialties in anatomy, and there are many specialties in physiology, and if you think about the definitions of these bo both these fields, I'm sure you can come up with even more examples than I have listed here. And I'm just going to go over just a couple so that you understand the, diff the, the terminology more than anything else. If we're studying structures that are so small to where we need a microscope, we refer to that study, of course, as microscopic anatomy. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the other hand, if we can see the structures with our bare eyes, we refer to that form of anatomy as gross anatomy. And you can see that spelled over here. We can also have anatomists that tend to really focus on a particular part or parts of the body that are concentrated together. And so maybe those are more regional anatomists. And, and a good example of that could be an ear, nose, throat specialist. Clearly that, or it, even a dentist. These are doctors that are more focused on a particular area of, or region of the body. Your general practitioner you go to when you have the flu or strep throat, uh, to, just to give you uh, some examples, is more of a systemic anatomist, meaning that that's a, a doctor that really has to have knowledge of all the different parts in the body. Now clearly a doctor is most often going to be both an anatomist and a physiologist. Um, it's, it's actually really difficult to tease these two studies uh, apart. I would say that most specialties in physiology tend to end in physiology. Hierarchies play a very important role in anatomy and physiology. Pretty much every organ system that you will be introduced to will touch on some form of hierarchy. And why is that so important? Well, without you having a very good understanding of how the body is put together, without you having a very good understanding of the gross anatomy and the microscopic anatomy, we really can't move on with studying the physiology. So it's going to be really crucial for you to keep track of which structure that you were introduced to fits inside of which next structure and that next structure does that contain even smaller structures. That's what we refer to as the hierarchy. And a hierarchy really doesn't have a top or a bottom. Um, you know, if we go outside of biology and we look at uh, the hierarchy of a college, we have in, in the college where I am at the top, we have, and I use the, the term top, which is really not really totally relevant, as I'll explain. We have the president, then we have the vice presidents, then we have the deans, then we have the associate deans, then we have the faculty, and then we have the students. But we could really put the students at the top and move downward that way towards the president. So I, I'm really trying to explain to you that in a hierarchy, you don't really have a top and a bottom. Um, it, it's just that the, a hierarchy has a direction more than anything else, meaning that one structure will fit inside of another structure. And so on, on the right-hand side, you see a hierarchy that I'm hoping you're pretty familiar with already. Clearly, atoms, uh, when we put a bunch of atoms together, we form a molecule, put some molecules together, and we can make a bigger molecule, a macromolecule, maybe a compound that will lead to the formation of organelles. We could actually, uh, between macromolecule and cell, put organelles, put some organelles together, we form cells. And if we put the right cells together, we can form a tissue, form, uh, put two or more tissues together, and we form an organ which then can form organ systems and ultimately an organism. Now this hierarchy can go further. Um, in the field of biology, we would continue with this ar uh, hierarchy by putting organisms together to form a population, and we can keep going on and on and on. 
for a class in human anatomy and physiology, we would stop at the level of the organism. Now, there are a couple of definitions I'd like to really cl clarify because these are things we're going to study in quite a bit of depth in this class, starting with tissue. And a tissue is described as a group of cells that have similar functions. A group of cells that has uh, similar functions. And with there are in our body many different tissues, but all of them belong to one of these four tissue categories. As a matter of fact, we will, after the introductory chapter that we're covering in this video, move on to histology, which is the study of tissues. We will first focus on the epithelial tissues and then the connective tissues. Then we'll take a little bit of a break from the tissues. And then as we study the muscular organ system, you'll be introduced to the muscle tissues. And as we get to the uh, nervous system, you'll get introduced to the nervous tissue. So these are the four major tissue categories in the body. All tissues belong to one of these categories. For instance, blood and bone belong to the connective tissues. The most superficial layer of your skin belong to the epithelial tissues. And so what is an organ? An organ is made up of two or more tissues. And so we have very simple organs that are only made up of a couple of tissue layers. And I will introduce you to an example of a very simple organ here in just a moment. Most organs are going to be made up of more than just two tissues. And then finally, organ systems by pretty much by default now is a group of organs that work together. Be sure you know these definitions. Be sure you know your four major groups or categories of tissues. Now in this class, you're obviously going to focus on organ systems and we're not going to be able to cover all of the organ systems in the first part of anatomy and physiology. There is a second component in which you will wrap up the other organ systems. The whole point of you taking this class is to study the organ system. So by no means do I expect you to know all the details right off the bat of the organ systems, but you really should be able to, off the top of your head, be able to list all the organ systems. Uh, from the integumentary system to the endocrine system, the reproductive systems, the immune system, etc., etc., etc. Talking about the immune system, the immune system is not truly considered to be an anatomical organ system. It's really an, a, an organ system that borrows organs from all kinds of other organ systems, such as the lymphatic system, such as the uh, cardiovascular system, uh, even the digestive system and more. Um, so we ref often it is referred to more as a functional organ system. Understand too that an organ system all by itself really doesn't do much of any good to us. We need to have good co cooperation, collaboration or good interrelationship between all of the different organ systems. So as you learn about them and as you read about them, um, be sure that you, you can explain in your own words some of these interrelationships. Finally, it's really important that you can list examples of organs that belong to each organ system or vice versa. You should be able to match organ systems I'm sorry, organs with their particular organ systems. For instance, the spleen belongs to the lymphatic system, the, the liver belongs to the digestive system, etc.